Welcome to the Studio African Utility Week. I'm Rose Bundock and I'm joined now by Ivan Barron, Chief Technology Officer EDMI. Very good to meet you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. You obviously have a lot of expertise within uh, the Australian, New Zealand, Asia, Pacific region. Just wondering if you can comment on the general landscape of smart metering in those, in those regions at the moment. There's obviously a lot of activity. Um, we've done a lot of work in uh, New Zealand, um, a large role out there with GPRS. It's been uh, going very well. Um, it's progressing now to the point where the customer is, is seeing what else they can do with that system. Uh, it's been in the field for a number of years, and it's like, okay, we can now add services onto that. Um, the Australian market uh, is evolving. They're recently bringing in um, a new way of, of selling electricity really in terms of power of choice. Mm. So the idea of that will be the consumer has the, the choice of what sort of meter that they want. You need to have okay. a basic level of functionality. Okay, we need a disconnect relay, we need uh, to be able to measure this. But beyond that, there's avenues for utility or retailer to sell. Okay, well we can upsell you on these additional functions that will help you. Um, so it's driven by the consumer rather than driven by the utility deciding what the customer should have. How, how do you think that would work in practice? Do you think the consumer understands enough about functionality to be able to de you know, decide what they need? Well, obviously it, it's, it's quite new in terms of bringing it in. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone else has really done a similar sort of approach. Um, but obviously the retailers and so on will be there to, to sell a particular package and sell a particular option like any sort of commercial product. Right, and how do energy companies feel about that? I think it's seen as, as a big move. Um, mm -hmm. There's a difference in terms of between the distribution companies and the retailers, uh, the network companies, about who should be driving it, how the rollout happens, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But where we are now, it has changed in terms of it's now driven effectively by the consumer and the retailers far more than the network companies. Um, that they're still trying to get, well, how can we then take information that we can then sell to the network companies mm. and still give those benefits to the network companies even though the network companies aren't owning the asset. And what about the kind of switching times? Is, is that regulated as uh, you know, the minimum of, amount of time that consumers I think they're switch? still switch, uh, getting into the details of that. Mm. I mean, the UK has focused on very fast switching times. Yeah. So I was like, we want to be able to switch every day, mm. um, every day of the year, 365 <laughs> days, a, if you want to. Yes. Um, and a lot of the system has been focused around that. Um, in general, of course, no one is going to do that, or very unlikely to mm. do that. Um, that can affect, I guess, how a retailer packages products. Um, same as in the mobile phone industry, mm. you have a cheap calling at this time of day or this time of day mm. and they, they take that and package it all up and then turn it into the real cost of the airtime or the electricity um, trying to get that that perfect sort of solution and package that benefits the consumer and also makes money and what about in the um, the communication protocol space in Australia uh, what, what are you seeing there in Australia probably uh, protocols is, is being not so much focused on standards, more around getting the data. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of the main thing you want to get out of the meter is a set of data, and you want to get that in the best way uh, possible. Mm -hmm. So they aren't specifying any sort of particular protocols uh, in delivering that, but they're just saying, well, we want this piece of information, and we want it this often. So you can sort out how you're going to do that, um, and how you're going to make sure you can work with different products and so on, but in the end it's the data that's important. And have there been any major problems with connectivity? Um, not really. I mean, we're moving from a, a system of uh, historically systems like um, the iTron's MB90 system that goes back decades uh, to newer systems. We have our own head ends. Um, then bringing out a new sort of cloud head end in terms of really uh, allowing scalability in terms of that. And a lot of that is coming into, well, what systems does it plug in into in the back end? Um, not just plugging into the meter, because in the end, 
you can write a driver or someone to talk to a different meter. Um, DLMS, for instance, does have a lot of variations and it does take a concerted effort in a country to develop the particular reference case for that country and what seats that country's need. Um, so all those things need to be solved and it's, yeah, it, it hasn't really stopped the industry. Um, and there's been a lot of innovation and, and so on historically in that um, of the go back to the very old protocols like 1107, which is a text-based protocol, and that ended up conflicting with the requirements of the utilities where they wanted to read in 30 seconds and you couldn't get the data that quickly. Um, so everyone adapted in terms of, okay, we need a faster protocol to deliver what the customer needs because in the end it's about delivering data. Yeah. Um, and spreading that data around and getting it to the people who need it and doing the analytics and so on on that. How many endpoints are in the field in Australia, would you say, connected? Um, Australia's the, the main actual smart meter in terms of connected meter rollout has been done in Victoria. Mm. Um, it probably suffered a little bit in terms of the promotion of it when it came out. Um, the government perhaps didn't really do as big a promotion job as it should have mm. um, in terms of it had the ball in terms of doing that. Um, and there was a bit of a kickback, I guess, from the, the customer base in terms of that because there wasn't yeah. an education there in terms of, well, what are you, what are you doing? What, mm. what do these changes mean for me? So a lot of the rest of the industry in Australia has stood back a little. Um, still a lot of work going on in uh, commercial and industrial metering and, and that sort of space and, okay. and people doing projects just because they make sense there. But in terms of a government, you will do it now. Mm. That, that hasn't really happened until now with the sort of power of choice changes. Okay, so under the power of choice, you must have a smart meter, but you're you, allowed to choose there it. There is a certain base level of functionality that's being specified. But you, as a consumer, you must have one, or the utility must require one, or it hasn't quite got to I'm that? I'm not exactly sure. It's, okay. it's all been very new at the moment. Yeah. Um, there are a set of regulations in that in terms of what the opt-out clauses and so on are and what the penalties are. Um, I'm not quite sure on that. Hmm, so it'll be an interesting case study to follow actually to see how that kind of evolves. Would other countries look to adopt yeah, that? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around the specific rules and mm. um, the different parties coming in now, the rules have been released and going, okay, well, we think it should be like this yeah. and so on. So it's going through that process, you know, mm. it's a dem democratic process. <laughs> And then moving to um, Asia, where obviously EDMI is based in um, headquartered in Singapore. Um, what trends are you seeing in, in metering there? Is it smart prepaid? Is it um, AMR still? Everyone has their own solutions. Um, we, there's a lot of focus in terms of AMR uh, in terms of the high-end customers, because they give you your biggest benefit. Mm. Um, we've done some big projects in, uh, in Thailand uh, with very aggressive read schedules. So these are on larger customers, but okay. they read the meters every 15 minutes. And that lets them do things like if they see something untoward happening, they mm. can send someone, send a truck out there um, basically within an hour um, to do something about it okay. um, rather than waiting for a monthly read or something like that. Right. And what would be the penalty? Do you know? What um, it, it goes through a set of legal proceedings. I'm, I'm not sure in terms of the exact penalties, mm. but it is something they, they vigorously pursue. That's protecting the revenue is something that they see yeah. as being a, a very important part of their business. Is it a cultural thing? I mean, is it a large-scale problem in, in Asia? I wouldn't say it's a large-scale problem. Uh, I wouldn't say it's not a problem. Mm. Um, but it certainly is a focus in terms of minimising avenues for Tampa, because um, in the end you want to have a fair system so that everyone pays mm. what, what they should be paying. Um, in the end, metering just splits up. Somewhere you generate it, it costs money to do that. You distribute it, you have to split it up equally, evenly into, well, how much should you pay for your share of generating it <laughs> mm. in the plant. So. 
Yeah. Mate, you want everyone to play fair so that you can afford to buy those generation and distribution systems. And how ready are markets like Vietnam, Philippines, you know, for those larger scale rollouts? Or are they there up and running already? Uh, the focus has been on, on the commercial industrial level, as I say, that, that's yeah. the largest yeah. benefit there. Um, most of the countries in the region are looking for new opportunities, larger rollouts, doing the cost benefit. What is it that will make sense for our country? Mm. Um, every country is different. Um, there's different ways a network is constructed. There's, there's different cultures, there's different ways houses are constructed which affect communications, the type of meter, um, the, the type of ways it's installed. Mm. So um, every country is different in that respect. Yeah. And again, I mean, the metering communication elements module, are you, do you use a variety of um, We do use a variety. We, we haven't, if, if we'd found the perfect one that mm. worked everywhere, it would, it would be great. We, we do a lot of uh, GPRS and, and 3G. Um, we found that that works very well. Um, the New Zealand rollout is something like 800,000 plus meters on that system. Okay. Um, and part of the success there is working very closely with the telco as well in terms of coming up with a, a system and a way of packaging the data that worked for everyone involved. Mm. Um, but we've also done work with mesh radio systems, PLC systems. Within the same rollouts? Or um, would they tend to be separate? It tends to be separate. Usually you end up with an infill even of different technologies. Mm. Um, so you may require some DPRS or 3G just to fill in a gap. Um, and we see everyone has a different approach. In the UK, we're doing uh, the communications hub project with that. So that is uh, 10 million uh, sites uh, in terms of a long range radio system. Mm. Um, and that works well for the UK. Yeah. Um, so. I don't know if you're familiar what they're doing in Japan. They're looking at like a sort of um, looking at using three types within the same rollout. So yeah. PLC. Um, you, you, you have different areas. I mean, your urban areas. I think they're looking more at PLC. Exactly. I mean, very the regional rise. areas is sort of um, GPRS or yeah. 3G and, and so on. And then in the middle, uh, the mesh of, radio. Yeah, sort the, of the solutions. Um, so what would be you know as a CTO? What's your opinion? of that approach? Do you feel it's overly complex? I don't necessarily think it's overly complex. Um, a lot of it is about optimising your solution. Um, it comes down to the costs, um, the, the type of building construction, like if, if you have a building made of concrete and steel mm. versus a wood construction, you're going to get favour PLC maybe because it it can get around a, a metal infrastructure. Or RF works very well because it's just wood and it can punch through that. So mm. it's, there are different solutions. Um, we, we found that often, yeah, you, you just need that mix. Um, the yeah. one, oft, often you can get one solution that will deal with a large portion of a country. Um, but in the end, you know, people want to read 100% of the meters. Mm. Um, it's not. 95 or 98 percent in the end you do want to read all of them um, otherwise you know how do you give those people a bill yeah you know, how do you cover <laughs> cover the costs so. what about um, in your own research department what kind of things are you looking at what trends are you seeing um, there's a lot of bringing down, I guess, a lot of our history is in commercial and industrial space, and we're seeing a lot of that functionality and features that we typically offered in that higher end space mm. now coming down into the residential market. So people want that similar level of capability, um, aspects like security, um, load control functionality, uh, monitoring different uh, situations in the uh, power system. Um, there's a case to say, well, if someone's delivering you power, what quality of power is that? Mm. Um, is, it, is it at the right frequency? Is it the right voltage? Am I getting it 24 hours a day? Um, is it causing damage to my equipment? Well, that can be you know, sensitive data in a way in terms mm. of utility, <laughs> who owns that data and whatnot. Absolutely. But 
it's useful to a utility as well to make sure that the product that they are delivering is a high quality product. You gave a talk today on getting the most from your smart meter. And we're talking about obviously about the data collection and, and using that data for, for benefits both for utility and customer. Do you see that happening out in the field? Are people really getting the benefit? We, we do. Um, I think basic thing when you first do a rollout what we've seen is it's, it's basic readings okay I'm getting watt hours I'm getting bar hours I can bill off that that that's my core thing but then once you've, you've cracked that original nut and all your systems are ticking along and you start looking at okay well what else can I get out of this system and start moving on to some of the other functionalities okay sag swell data to look at well what's the quality of my power system where are my voltages running average volt basic information like average voltage, min, max voltage. Power companies can start to use that or sell that data onto network companies to sort of go, okay, well you need to put an extra transformer in here because we're getting okay. sags down the end of the line. Mm. So rather than waiting for customers to complain, um, they can proactively go, mm. okay, well, we've got a situation here. Okay. We need to prioritize that in our maintenance or, or capital mm. budget and, and solve that issue. Um, so it is a is a growing thing. We've seen um, rolling out things like ripple control, which in a lot of smart grid is seen as old technology, but a number of utilities have it. They bought it. It still works. It works. It does the purpose. Um, so we add ripple functionality to the meter so we can then add, you know, interact with that system and do more than perhaps a normal ripple relay can do. Um, and opens up new opportunities for tariffs and energy management and that demand management, which mm. is sort of key if you're starting to hit the limits of your distribution system. Um, renewable energy has its own ups and downs in that, in that if the sun doesn't shine, you don't get power. Yeah, so um, that has its, its effects on managing demand as well. Fortunately, in places, uh, if you look at somewhere like Australia, the main load would be air conditioning load. So when the sun is shining during the day, that's when you probably have your main load mm. due to your air conditioning. Yeah. So um, if balances. you look at a colder climate, then you've got a heating load that's going to peak during the evening, not mm. during the day. So you have this offset. How do you store the energy? Um, so the um, Europe are looking at, okay, well, we can store energy here. Norway, they've got great dams and so on. We can pump energy there, then pull it back. We've got wind over here, we've got <laughs> nuclear over here, um, putting all that together. Um, it's quite fascinating mm. in terms of the scale and breadth yeah, um, of what's happening. Thank you, Ivan. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for joining us. Um, that's all for now from the studio, African Utility Week.